Wow. Bang. Okay, folks, um, can I grab your attention, please? You won't be able to hear me speaking through this microphone, um, so don't look out for speakers. This should be working through. Uh, this is really so that these guys can capture what I'm saying, and you're now capturing it? Okay, so I look like a fool standing here with a microphone. Uh, <laughs> these guys are mic'd up. So welcome. Um, this is number two of our Design Dialogues 2020 um, series. Uh, can I have a quick show of hands from postgrad students that were at the first one before the Easter break? Okay, so no pressure, but you know how this works. So I'm looking at you guys, and I'm sat down the front with you guys. Um, ben is uh, on the uh, iPhone, strict timing. Um, for those of you here for the first time, the way this works is that our invited speakers get 20 minutes, not 19 minutes, not 21 minutes, 20 minutes, and we cut them off. The floor is then over to you, and you have our speakers for 20 minutes. Okay, and it's a dialogue, it's a conversation, it's questions, but it's your responsibility. Uh, I don't know how many decades I've been teaching, um, a few, but as a tutor, at the end of a point where you've invited a speaker in and they finish speaking, you have that moment of terror that never goes away, that you want your students to represent themselves, their course, the school, the college, the university, and yourself as the tutor by asking intelligent, articulate questions and not for this silence. Okay, so the pressure is on. It's an opportunity. You've got 20 minutes with these guys. And then afterwards, um, we made the mistake last time of providing slightly too much in the way of uh, glasses of wine and beer. And the 20 minutes that you have for networking at the end turned out to be about 120 minutes. Um, so we will throw you out after approximately <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, but welcome to postgrad students. This is for you. Welcome to our friends from the School of Design. Thank you all for coming and uh, being part of this. Um, I'm going to say just a few words about, um, uh, well, I was going to say Alex and Will and It's Nice That. I'll leave them to talk about It's Nice That. Uh, Alex and Will um, met as students, I'm guessing that would have been 2005 then? Uh, 2004. 2004. 2004, okay. Um, they were both students at uh, University of Brighton studying uh, BA Graphic Design, and um, I can remember them coming to me as course director on that course as second year students with the idea of a project which was called If I Could Do Anything Tomorrow, What Would It Be? And they had a whole list of very high level big name people that they wanted to contribute to this project. And I tried to help them find a way of moderating their expectations. Uh, they weren't going to get so-and-so. This person was going to be too busy. And they proved me completely wrong. Everybody they asked, I think everybody they asked to do it, pretty much did the project. And it was a fantastic um, uh, thing to come out of Brighton at that point. Um, the two of them went on to set up. It's nice that they may talk about that. They employ 15 people. They've moved into brand new premises and are very excited because they have natural light, I think, for the yeah. first time, 3,000 square Woo! feet. Um, and they're both co-directors of uh, It's Nice That. If you don't know It's Nice That, then you've got to ask yourself why. They're going to be talking about it, and they're going to be talking to you about what they do. So that's my three minutes over. How are we doing with the timer, Ben? Okay. Without further ado, I, uh, I hand you over to Alex and Will. If it's nice that. Um, thank you, Lawrence. Um, it's worth starting just by apologising that Alex and I no longer text each other in the morning to find out what each other's wearing. So <laughs> it was Alex that said this morning. It hadn't even crossed my mind, um, but he did raise the issue that maybe we shouldn't both be wearing pretty much exactly the same thing. What, what, what you haven't seen is the grey jumper we both took off, which is also identical. But. We'll just start texting each other again as of tomorrow. All right. Um, so, thanks for asking, Lawrence, thanks for asking us to be here. Um, Come on, only 20 minutes, mate. <laughs> um, so, we're going to talk about who we are, uh, this kind of theme of why accessibility is important to what we do, and then kind of more importantly, how it actually feeds into our work. Um, it's also worth pointing out at this stage that we got made visiting fellows of LCC this year for a couple of years, so it's also kind of a big opportunity for us to kind of start that conversation, which we'll lead on to a little bit as well. Um, a quick intro to kind of, it's nice that, um, for those of you that don't know, 
Um, a project that, as I said, started out of a kind of university brief and has kind of grown since there. Uh, as it exists today, uh, it exists to champion creativity across the world of art and design. Um, we believe it has a few points of difference that separates it from uh, other kind of design online publications uh, that might be considered similar. They are the breadth of creative reference. So we're not a graphic design blog. We feature graphic design, illustration, photography and art primarily. We touch on fashion, sculpture, film. Um, but it's that idea that um, it's nice that it's much more a kind of reaction to an idea or a visual and it's, it's that breadth. It's also the breadth of creative expertise. So it's as much your big established familiar names, but it's as much you guys, it's the emerging names. It's putting those side by side and giving them equal weight and equal prominence. Um, and also, really importantly, it's that tone um, that we bring. And it's that that we consider to be super accessible. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about. Size-wise, it's about 300, 350,000 uniques visitors a month. Uh, and uh, alongside, it's nice that we run INT Works, which is a creative agency. Um, working with brands that, again, we'll touch on a little bit more a little bit later. Ultimately, though, what that means is there's a publishing company, there's a creative agency, all under the same roof. And I think what we really like about that is the conversations that that triggers, the kind of the way in which both sides feed into each other. Um, and yeah, in, that, in the new studio that we've got, those 17 people. So it's nice that it's made up of a team of seven, um, editorial, uh, events managers, sales, uh, project managers, and then IT Works is made up of project managers and art directors. Um, so it's 17 of us under one roof. What we really strive for um, as the kind of big top line is this idea of make it better. Um, we could all probably go and work for other agencies and kind of slot in elsewhere, but it's this idea that actually we're all there to try and contribute towards this idea of let's kind of try and challenge um, things. Let's not reinvent the wheel for the sake of reinventing the wheel, but let's try and challenge kind of preconceptions of, of the way things are set up. So, hello, everyone. Um, this is, I guess it's a cheesy stock image, but from day one when It's Nice That Started, it was about being positive. We were about to enter, we were at university when it started, we were about to enter a world of design that we felt, whether it's true or not, was full of ego and full of celebrities and full of people, you know, patting themselves on the back, like, look at how good everyone is. And we were just like, actually, you know what? It was important that It's Nice That um, subconsciously probably flattened that that playing field a little bit. We couldn't write, and so the writing was bad, which made it accessible. Um, we, had to be, we had to be positive, I think, because I don't think we were smart enough writers to criti criticise anything. In, we didn't have any experience. We didn't really know what was good or bad, I didn't think. Um, but also, we were just, I think, you know, when we'll set it up when, in the third year, it was about showing things that we just liked. And so inherently, that became a very positive thing and a very likeable thing obviously, because you could read a whole heap of other design criticism, and actually, it's nice that was, without us ever thinking this, was a breath of fresh air, really. Um, also, it was very natural, and there was no thought to it. It was just a reaction to university brief, so it was very easy for it to feel accessible, because I think the brief was about putting something in the public domain that made you feel better about yourself. So instantly, accessible was a very, very, very important part of of everything we did, and to not worry too much about the stuff we didn't like, why would we even comment on it? Loads of people are doing that. Um, and the name kind of fell out of that, we got very lucky with that, but none of, I guess what I'm trying to say is none of it was planned. Absolutely nothing was planned, obviously, because, I mean, the project you're doing today, that's essentially what it's nice that was. Um, and I guess that was a tiny seed with two of us, and so at that point, it's very, very, very easy to understand what It's Nice That stands for, or to keep some values, or to understand what fits on It's Nice That and what doesn't. Now we're 17, 18 people. It's much, much, much more difficult. So as we grew, this need for accessibility is the title of our talk, and it's something that we hold dear even now. We still feel like we're sitting where you are, really. And we want everyone who comes to work for us to understand that this isn't about fulfilling a massive ego that someone might have. It's about showing amazing work and about doing work in a little bit of a better way. So as we went along, we made these four values that um, ring true across all the businesses we do now and potentially all the businesses we, we might do that might sit alongside INT Works, and it's nice that. And again, like I said, these are... It's funny because we put these on the wall and they stand for human. This one's about being human. You get it? obviously. Positive, this idea of being broad, having a lot of different reference rather than just one, one practice, and also this attention to detail and this idea of high quality. So 
We stick them on the wall, but if people inherently aren't that way inclined when they come to interview, normally they're not right for the thing. It's not like we bring people in and kind of condition them on a conveyor belt of how to be. It's nice that. We're very lucky with it being seen by so many people. The people who normally come in want to protect it as much as we do. They love reading it. They love the way it is. And so it's like going to work for your favourite magazine. Actually, you want it to stay as it is. You want to keep all the bits that you really, really love. So we were writing down these values and even the way we, we needed to, to kind of translate them to the workforce had to be accessible. We had to draw them. If we could, I remember the first iteration we did was a Word document and we gave them to one of our managers and she said, well, no one's ever going to read these. Like, this is pointless. So this looks like a bit like a really serious business has done it. And I think that was another, another interesting point on our growth, really. And so with these as kind of our four guiding lights, as we call them, um, we believe accessibility will run through everything that we end up doing. So if you're these four things or you're a good part of these four things, then hopefully this accessibility that makes us what we are is so important to have a point of difference. Hopefully that rings true. And mine and Will's job more than ever is less about designing what the magazine looks like and more about protecting these values and looking at what, what we can do next. So I'm going to hand back to Will. Um, also, I've just realised that I haven't got a timer, I've only got a clock. So what, how long? How long 12 was minutes, mate. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's nice that this is, this is the website. Also, it's worth kind of really kind of reiterating at this stage as well. We're not, kind of, we're not here today to kind of go, accessibility, wow, you've never thought about that. Um, it's, not a kind of, it's not rocket science, but I think what's important and what we always reiterate is if you've got the kind of greatest content in the world, but you're making it difficult for people to engage with and find and everything else, then it's not going to work. You've got to kind of consider that. This is kind of the website. Again, it's not kind of, it's not groundbreaking design, but it's, it's considered, it's the hierarchy that kind of, it's, it's image-led. It's a write-off that kind of, kind of gives you an, an idea of what's to follow. And then it's kind of a short write-off and, and more images from the project, a link if you want to go and find out more. Um, a big reason for why it's nice that it's got the audience that it's got is because it's accessible, because it's easy to find, it's easy to share, it's easy to kind of talk about. One of the things that maybe it's not is the name outside of this country, we, it gets referred to as all sorts. It's that nice, it's nice, nice that, all sorts. We just need to buy all those domains and repoint them to. It's nice that. Um, so alongside the website, we also do a printed magazine. Um, and the kind of the accessibility here, we've... We did publish a magazine that went under the title of It's Nice That. It now goes under printed pages. Again, as a point of accessibility, it was about giving this thing its own life. There was confusion with um, a print title that had the same as an online. When you hear titles like Vogue, NME, Vice, your immediate connotation is print. When you heard It's Nice That, the immediate connotation was online. And therefore, to try and kind of run a, a printed title with the same name was a bit of a challenge. But here, the real kind of points of difference here are that the price we feel is is now accessible, it's five pounds instead of 10 pounds, um, and the content and tone of voice. It's also distributed, we have distributors that do the UK, Europe, North America, Australia, so you can walk into news agents, kind of cultural institutions, and find it. It is something that isn't kind of too difficult to find. Um, I'm not gonna play, um, I will, uh, got time to play this? Taxi, you know, Sark, the camera on the long lens, uh, long exposure, that became a scarf. Um, you know, go to an exhibition and that became a piece of fabric. That is a piece of pretty close to the other one. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we'll move on, shall we? <laughs> Beach Hut Sweater. Beach Hut Sweater. <laughs> Beach Hut Sweater. Um, it's all about using your eyes, really. You need to say, you look at the beach up, a great sweater. Come on, that's what I do. Yeah. The point here is we, we run two main events. We run here, which is an annual creative conference, and we run, run Nicer Tuesdays, which is a monthly, much more informal affair. The, the idea here is the way in which the content lives, and actually, Whereas you could have tried to tell that story as an online article or a magazine piece, actually sometimes the most accessible way of hearing about these creatives is to get them up on stage to talk passionately and kind of 
give you insight that you wouldn't gain elsewhere. Um, the challenge here is here is £125 a ticket, so it's not super accessible, and we totally realise that to students. There is a student price, but it's still £75, which we realise isn't as accessible. Nicer Tuesdays was a knee jerk to that to try and provide a cheaper alternative to coming to our events. Um, all, all of the talks are videoed and available for free afterwards. Um, Words, Words, Words was a, was a project that we did for Selfridges um, in January of 2012 for the first six weeks. Um, the big thing here was Selfridges got us to do this because of the kind of the accessible nature. They have tens of thousands of people walking past this sh the store every day. It's about trying to engage them, trying to interest them. Um, the theme was words, words, words. We put every posit positive adjective um, as a prediction in the window that you could go in and get. Um, it was super colourful, it was interesting, it caught people's attention, and as a result from the client, we know that the success of actually getting people in store to get one. Um, and I'm going to pass back to Alex. And I think before, before we start chatting about whether you think these things are accessible or not, which is also what we'd like to talk about, is we also do work for brands, doing work for ourselves that we're judging and we get to side the tone. Super easy to be accessible and to have it how we want. What we try and do is bring that same level of thinking to the work we do on INT Works, the work we do for agencies. Even though it goes, it's for a brief for big clients, we still try and keep that, those inherent values in what we're doing. So this is, a, I mean, Selfridges is kind of easy to be accessible and open to because it's mega creative, they've got big windows, you know, not the most difficult thing in the world. But this is a project we did for Unilever, you know, big holding company of loads of very everyday, ordinary objects, ordinary products. And they asked us whether for their big cocktail party in Cannes for the advertising festival, we could make people see their products in a different way, in a different light, and inspire them to think differently about pot noodle and mayonnaise and, you know, dove soap and some really, I, I'm, I'm excited about the products, but it was, uh, and that's what I think we can bring as an agency as well with this knowledge of what people look at, amazing people who do incredible work. Um, and so the way we work as INT Works is we have great creative direction in-house and then we find all these brilliant people we meet through It's Nice That to execute some things for us. So this is, um, these are some of the products we did for Unilever. So this is a Lipton tea lamp um, which smelt of lemon as you walk past it from lemon tea. And so the, the marketing managers who've seen, worked on Lipton for 30 years have never thought about Lipton in this way. And that for us is super exciting. And um, this is my favourite one. We refired dumbbells as... Um, uh, Hellman's jars of dumbbells, but this is all coming from working with brilliant talent and this is some guys called Leonard and Sander in, in Amsterdam and their take on Unilever was, oh we love Hellman's, our favourite mayonnaise, but we're worried about like, looking good on the dance floor, so we're going we're gonna to do this thing where we can work out and eat mayonnaise at the same time. <coughs> but Unilever, massively inaccessible, huge brand, 40,000 people working marketing. You can't imagine the size of this company. And um, we managed to get, does anyone know who Martin Sorrell is? But he's like the richest man in advertising. Suddenly Unilever, with a little bit of thought, have a way. He comes to the party, he's never come to the party before, but also our client here can talk to Martin Sorrell about mayonnaise. I just think that's great. I mean, he's, when has he ever picked up a mayonnaise bottle in front of the SVP of Hellman's and gone, wow, this is cool. <laughs> and so, although we're subverting it a little bit, we still, and not all of our product, Projects are just jokey and silly, and this one is for sure. But again, we bring that thought process, and we believe, and it's not the only way you can approach design, but for us, accessibility is the most interesting way. And maybe it comes from intellect, or maybe it comes from something else that we lack, but I feel like we, we much prefer our work to be enjoyed at face value almost than, than, than not. And so on that, this is a really silly project we did for ASOS where... Um, I'm going to show you, it's a video, so I'm going to talk about it before, but they're trying to market a denim range to a whole demographic who don't really engage in fashion. So that's pretty tough already. They, I mean, their strategy around their audience was about, they say it's guys at university who are getting two twos who don't really care about jeans. They want to pop, try them on, and if they fit and they're cheap, that's great. So like, well, how do you sell denim to those people? So we made these 12 stupid films saying that denim can solve any manly problem. De ASOS have got so much denim, Anything, any problem you've got, we can solve it. This is one of 12. I urge you to watch all of them because <laughs> it makes a bit more sense, but anyway. You might need to press it again. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> 
Edward Carey on Twitter is looking to become the next Silicon Valley millionaire. That kiss your friends and family goodbye if I were you, Eduardo. You're gonna be far too big time to hang around with the likes of them anymore. For this, you'll need an ASOS dinner shirt with manual detail, two Bluetooth headsets, one copy of the financial news, a comb, a necktie, and a pin. Step one, put on the ASOS shirt. Step two, comb your hair executive style upon the tie and pin. Step three, attach the Bluetooth headset to place the newspaper under your arm. Step four, gate crash a meeting and repeat the phrase, We need to think outside the box and create a win-win situation that monetizes our online content. Edward, you've just been appointed CEO! Your tech nonsense has burned you a massive paycheck! ASOS Devon does it again! Keep your challenges coming in, man! So somehow they ran with it, all these things. And you could buy the shirt now because you want to be a millionaire and all those kind of things. So anyway, we got, somehow we got away with that. This, this, and then on a bit more of a serious note before we run out of time, this is a project we did for Nike who asked us to engage more, during the Olympics in 2012, engage more young people in East London to play sport. How do you do that? You could do it a million ways. We suggested to them that we should regenerate a park that wasn't working in Shoreditch in East London because there's no green space to play. So this is what ASCII Gardens on Pitfield looked like before and then what we did afterwards. Very light touch, but we made it a place that people wanted to go and we thought that instantly that would make it more accessible for people to play sport. Essentially the only issue they had wasn't that they didn't have trainers, was because they didn't have any way to do it. So we then understood that we made a spectacle with United Visual Artists to do this big trampoline installation that when you bounced on it, it played different music and you could go on with your friends. And again, sport doesn't have to be this massively inaccessible thing. We were like convincing Nike that trampolining was sport was reasonably tricky, but um, was something we were like, if you actually want the community to use it, give them something they can use. You put up a basketball court, 10 people a day can use it and want to use it. And so Again, although a much, much, much more serious issue than selling denim, potentially, again, this accessibility, I think, inherently comes through our work. Um, yeah, and I guess that's it. A final slide. Uh, so, it's, so, yeah, so that's kind of us and who we are, but it's very much, and I guess the setup of this 2020 helps the slides more because it's, I think, as interesting as you may have found the last 20 minutes, I'm much more interested in the, the next 20 and actually the kind of the start of that conversation. I think education is kind of in a really interesting time. Is it as accessible as it was five years ago with fees and everything else? Maybe not, who knows? But it's, it's about that thing of kind of, I think everyone's got good intentions, as this kind of image suggests, but for whatever reason, it doesn't quite work. Or there, there are things that don't quite work. And actually, maybe with just a little bit of thought or to do something a little bit different, or I think you can reach some quite interesting outcomes. So I think that's probably about 20 minutes. And if we're under, you don't just make a stand here until... Exactly Don't. Excellent. <laughs> but also, I think also as, yeah, we've got an opportunity as fellows to have access to you guys for the next two years. And what we don't want to do is come here and work out how we can make our business better from what you tell us. What we want to do is see how it's nice that our thinking can influence education in the smallest way over the next two years and learn from you guys about what we could be doing to help make things a bit more accessible or is that even necessary. So I guess we want... We want the issues, we want the problems, really. And then we want to go away and think about what we could do to try and inspire some change. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So, guys, your 20 minutes starts now. Do you want to start with a question to these guys, or do you want to take questions? No, we'll go the other way first. Okay. Yeah. So, um, those of you that were here before, you get to um, take this mic and then pass it amongst yourselves. So, who am I handing, handing this to first? Yes, the first question. I think you have to throw it as well. <laughs> I'm not throwing it. This is really to shame you guys into asking <laughs> questions. Come on, Linda, hit us. Um, could you tell us, I mean, you, it looks so simple, what yeah. you've achieved, but I know that I'm from publishing, and I know how difficult some things are, and it's great to see a new model. But you've taken a lot of risks getting there. Can you tell us your highest and lowest points of achievement, please? That's a very, very, very good question. And yes, it is a, publishing is a, um, a challenging world, and I think the, the, cha the change that's happened is people have worked out in our publishing generation of the last seven years that making money out of just doing publishing is actually maybe impossible if you're not of a certain scale. So I think we've looked at that and gone uh, and tried to find another way of doing it without just trying to make money in publishing really and staying afloat. But I say highest and lowest. My lowest are always, um, my lowest are always the difficulties with employees and with, you know, we started employing our mates really 
I mean, that, that's how it works, really. And now, five odd years on, that's a lot more difficult to do. And so a lot of the low points come with making difficult decisions about people that you really like that maybe aren't helping the business anymore, potentially. And we've not had to do much of that at all, but there's a realisation that things aren't all flowery all the time. Also, on that, I think those pinch points are always at the next point of change. I think you, we could have stayed as five people and kind of gone along and done nice things, but we've wanted to push it. And I think as you push it, someone who maybe joined you and was kind of getting involved in everything suddenly now has a job role, which is to do, to look after one specific thing. And I think naturally, and I think it's not just within our organisation, any organisation that grows, the people that were there at one stage understand that this is very different to how it was and it's not the same. And it's interesting looking at the first few people that joined us, probably are the people who aren't with us anymore. Um, on the kind of challenge side, I'd say that the thing that I always refer back to is if things are easy, then everyone does them. And actually, one of the really exciting things is where you come up against the challenges, you get to try and look at an alternative way. And we've had to change things. The magazine, as it stood, became too far too much of a vanity project that we weren't close enough to. And therefore, we had to stop. And funnily enough, um, someone once told me that if you ever stop anything, don't tell anyone. As soon as you tell them there's uproar, people are like, oh, shit, what, what, what do you mean you stop doing that? If you just stop it, people just ignore it. People don't realise. We didn't publish a magazine for 12 months. But when we launched the new thing, there's a really great response. And we kind of it took, we took our time to get to that point. And as a result, we invested less into an item um, because essentially we invested too much that took the fun and enjoyment out of getting back into the studio because immediately you go, OK, cool, we've now got how many thousand to sell before we break even and then we're going to make money. Whereas now it comes back in, it's already in profit and every copy we sell is. So that, that enjoyment and the kind of the, the excitement in the studio. But the, and the, the high point for me, because there are so many difficulties with running a business and there's a lot of, you're taking a lot of pressure. We get in at, we've got in at 7.30 every day for five, six years, however long that is. And Will now lives in Brighton, so even harder. But... Um, the, the plus for me comes in seeing the people we employ, understanding what we do, and taking it somewhere we could have never taken it. Genuinely, that's the, I'm, I'm sure lots of managers say that stuff, but it's genuinely so exciting that at Unilever Project, I would have had so little to do with, because the ideas are so much better from our great art directors and great project managers. And that, for me, personally, is a high point of this little seed that was set up a long time ago is now facilitating 16 brilliant people to, one, have a job, in a difficult time, but also to create things that we never could have created on our own. So I'd say that's a massive high. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. You, just, you are inside the uh, design reference venue. Uh, you are, uh, do, how do you see uh, aesthetics, trendings, and what's the, the whole in a thing? Like it's nice that and other design websites uh, setting up the ways that aesthetics will happen inside the design yeah. community? It's a really interesting one, and I think it's, it's, it's one that comes up a lot that almost kind of the blog generation is, is uh, guilty of people making imagery for the internet and for blogs as opposed to actually for kind of real things and practical things. And I think it's just, I don't know, for, for it's nice that I think it's about maintaining a kind of integrity and rationale to editorial discussions as to why we champion this work. Um, and every now and again there is the kind of the thing that is just pure aesthetic and actually it doesn't have any weight beyond that but I think they're potentially the most interesting questions um, and the interesting conversations that go on within that editorial team and editorial discussions as to as to why something ends up on its nice that or in printed pages. What I think is important is context I think a big problem with the visual mood the mood board that is the internet is that there's no context and you don't know where it's from and you you don't understand anything about it apart from you like the look of that sky. And I think that was a real issue. We've always been hell-bent on adding context and crediting and making sure that something might come for that person from the publishing of that image rather than just, oh, look, aren't I cool? I've found all these great images. That was never the point. That was never the point. I always got frustrated at Brighton when visiting speakers came in and said, well, I've been published in this and that and that. It's like, but that should be the start of something. Why aren't you telling me the news? Why aren't you telling me the real stuff? Like, that should have been the start of... Okay, so what did that publicity get you or enable you to do? I was never, I always hated the idea that someone being on It's Nice, that was the end of our relationship with them. And that's also why we had the agency, was to, if we can enable them to continue working and give them commissions to 
not only just make that stuff and think it's cool, but also to actually work and pay their mortgage, I thought that's way more interesting. I think. And there are some of the massive high points So when you get an email from an illustrator or photographer who says, thanks for posting my work, I've just been commissioned by X, Y, Z. And those two-line emails are the kind of the real high points that you kind of, it, re it reminds you why we're doing what we do. Uh, I just wanted to understand your decision behind running printed pages and why you think it's relevant or how it adds value to It's Nice That. Great question. You're looking at me now. <laughs> hey, mate. I'll, I'll uh, print. Yeah, great question. How am I going to answer this? Print, I think it's, I think a big part of everything that we do is about kind of asking why and recognizing that why. And printed pages is, Printed Pages allows us to have conversations and kind of tell stories that we can't do elsewhere. And at the moment, that is, print is still the best means for that. Now, I'm totally open to the idea that in a couple of years, someone will do something on the iPad or a tablet that suddenly offers the kind of feeling and kind of tangible nature of print media. Uh, that's one side is that it's, we, can, we can produce content that elsewhere we can't, we can't, it can't exist. I think it's still for us a profitable, um, sustainable model uh, fundamentally. I think everything that we try and do, that's always the ambition. We don't run, I think I'm right in saying, any project that we go into going, right, this is going to cost us five grand, but hey, hopefully it will lead to this. Um, thirdly, it is, a f it is still a fantastic kind of thing to give someone, it, be it a creative that's coming to the studio to show us a portfolio of work, be it a new client, be it an existing client, be it the, the guys in the studio, it still holds f so much more weight than other things, a link in an email, to go, hey, this is who we are, and actually it shows an attention to detail, uh, an awareness, uh, kind of all those things. And it's, it's the thing that possibly, more than anything else in the studio at the moment, is the thing that we, we regularly kind of question and go, is, is this still what we should be doing? Because... I think the other thing that's worth saying is Alex and I own uh, the Hudson Beck Group, which owns both in part, 50% um, each. There's no one else telling us, there's no one else above going, hey, you need to, like, where's the next Mac? And actually, if it's not right, I'd like to think that we will make that decision and, and it will be for the right reasons. Um, and I think that goes for everything. If, if online suddenly became totally different, it wasn't feasible, then we'd question that. And I think that's, again, that's the exciting thing is to put things out there, see the reaction, if they're not right, take them out and have the confidence to do that, not kind of get into this um, pattern where it's just like, oh, here's the next mag. And, and the thought and consideration that goes into it is totally lost because you just get into a routine. But also, I think this is a good example, OK? So this is a piece of work that we can commission brand new from a great illustrator. And tell me how something like this would work online. A great comic, a brilliant piece, a story, a sense of... Um, you don't know what's next, a sense of journey, and if, they can, if we can do that online, amazing, but I am yet to meet a human being who won't enjoy reading that there more than they will online. And that's the latest trend of articles at the moment, is that the, the kind of new stand model of, printed publica of, of digital publication is dying, and it's reverting back to being an in-browser experience to, to engage with that content. So... Morning. Hi. Uh... While you started off as a company, uh, what was the first thing, I mean, you were confident about? Or what is that thing which actually boosted your journey, confident, boosted your confidence in your journey? We said for, I reckon, six months on a weekly basis, it's all right, mate, we can always go and get proper jobs. Yeah. And I think it was that. I think was, we still say that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we definitely, it definitely reached the point where it was like, we might end up doing this for a long time. Yeah. Um, I think we, we, everyone's different. And I think the last thing that I ever want to do when we talk to people is kind of try and kind of outline a step-by-step. -step. You too can run a publishing company. In a it's, it's much more a kind of circumstance of opportunity. We were friends first and foremost, um, lived together for two years down at Brighton while we were studying. Um, we did that side project, again, with no kind of great ambition. It was never a, right, let's start a business. And I think... I think I'd back myself to say a lot of those kind of collectives, peep show that also came out of um, Brighton Uni, that was never a kind of, as far as I believe, it wasn't like a sit down, right, we're going to be a collective. It's, we kind of ended up doing this. We both went and got proper jobs straight after graduating. I think there was a 15 minute conversation I remember having in Lawrence's office about. You tried to offer us space in Brighton, and we were like, 
no way, man. Yeah. Make this a real business. But we were like, no, we've studied for three years. Let's go and kind of go and get experience and kind of reference points elsewhere. But I, th I think um, the, f the thing that we had to do design work on the side as something else to make ends meet. We also didn't have to pay. We had a bit of loan left and some borrowed money that we didn't have to. I think we just paid ourselves like 300 quid a month or something just to cover a bit of the rent for maybe. No, I'd say it's more. We got one job. We got the YCN annual quite early on, which was a kind of three month yeah. thing of like 100 pounds a day each which was the security, which was the, actually, we can give this a go. And that's where the starting at 7 a.m. came from, is we were expected to be in at YCN from 9 till 6. So we used to get in at 7 and do two hours before that. Uh, we probably did a little bit of lunch, and then we'd stay for two hours after. And that's where that kind of worth e work ethic came from, is we were doing a kind of freelance job. But, and also, it was £100 a day each, and it was studio space. So we didn't actually have any overheads. And when that came to an end, we'd already lined up a few things that we were doing before and after and weekends. Um, and that was the, I think that was the big catalyst and to kind of say, actually, there's, an, a, there's a chance here. But also, the confidence was we, did the, we didn't know how to make money out of anything apart from publishing a magazine or a book like we'd done at Brighton on that side project. We understood that if you print something for £5, you sell it for £10, you make £5. And so the first magazine we did was the first thing we did when we, when we started this nice that properly in 2009 with both of us working on it. And we sold out a thousand copies of the first magazine in about six weeks and at that point I think it's probably the answer to your question is like actually you know what people have just looked at this thing online free every day like, it doesn't make it a business but actually if we're smart about this people will pay for something that we do whether that's a magazine or something else we didn't really know at that point that it became I don't know it became real at that point I think where people we were looking at our PayPal account going oh my god actually you know we could eat this month or something ambitions now fits nice that would you help the government like Jamie Oliver and school dinners and all that kind of stuff what, yeah. what are you gonna do <laughs> um, I don't think the idea that we go from this to <laughs> school dinner <laughs> I'm not sure we're as, we're as smart as Jamie Oliver but um, I think that the, 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 the really exciting part for us now is that we have a brilliant team that we're trying to remove ourselves from the day to day a little bit more so that we can think about what the third thing is what the fourth thing is what the fifth thing is and and again we're going back to that mantra of make it better so um, that's predominantly in the creative industry. I think there's a lot of things that are done not so well in the creative industry, which is why we set up the agency as we did, because we believe we can give more value to our clients um, and we can do more diverse work. The same as the publishing company, we believe there's a way of making publishing a bit in design a bit more accessible. And so whether that is um, opening a pub, or whether that's starting a recruitment company, or whether that's becoming estate agents, or whether that's become, who knows what it is, but I believe there's so many things being done in an underhand kind of non-transparent, open, accessible way that we could, if we can work these two things out to run beautifully, we could, we could do. And that's the plan. That's what we'd love to do is, is do something as the Hudson Beck group that, that has all those values that people might not expect. But specifically on It's Nice That, I think it's still to maintain that kind of top line of champion creativity across art and design. And I think it's, first and foremost, it's about kind of other people's work and elevating it and presenting it in a way that um, other people kind of enjoy, engage with, um, and want to be part of. Have you got any ideas? <laughs> All right. If you got any, just send them to us. Good. So we've got time for a couple more. Who are we handing the mic to? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Got like three yeah, here we go, yeah. <laughs> <Got it. laughs> um, has it changed much since you started out in terms of, like, are you getting lots of people that send you their work or is it still very much you're looking for what you want to find and it's you that's putting in what you show as other people telling you? Um, first part, uh, submissions, yeah, there's loads and it's, we're, we're currently evaluating the best way in which we can have those conversations. At the moment, it just ends up in an inbox. Like, I think it's submit at it's nice .com, and someone works through them. There are, there are more than enough lazy PR companies, and that is the bulk of that inbox. So actually, frustratingly, to find the work isn't maybe as easy as it could be. Um, we publish all editorial uh, email addresses of the editorial team so people can contact them directly. We have always kind of maintained this idea of that if someone sends you a personal email, they at least deserve a personal email back. Um, they're getting cleverer with the more generic ones, but it's for them to decide who they're getting back to. Um, but the thing that we will say is that when, when you end up writing for the site, 
you change your kind of outlook on the things that you're looking at and actually you pick up on something you'll see in a, in a weekend supplement or a uh, campaign you'll see on the tube or, and actually those things all feed in and you end up going, I wonder who did that. And a big part of it is still maintaining those ongoing relationships. Is actually, we're in that really fortunate position that people do want their work up on the site. It's, the onus is on the, the editorial team to be having those regular conversations so that as the work gets released, someone sending us an email through going, hey, we've just done this. It's and some studios are, are really forward and great at that. Other studios are still, they're not doing it for that, which I kind of like. They're not producing this work to end up on blocks. But hopefully we can kind of have those conversations to go, oh, it'd be great to talk to you about it, to add context, to add weight to it. I was saying to someone yesterday, it's, if I was going to start a, a blog about dinosaurs, I'm not into dinosaurs, so I'd have to really go out of my way to find some nine articles every day about dinosaurs. But everyone in that office, and yes, there's a certain amount of editorial, but there's also a big agency there. It's such a collaborative space that, you know, finding editorial isn't difficult because people are interested. You know, we're walking down the street, we're going to shows, we're going to the things, like Will says, and you have your eyes open. It's not like you sit down and go, right, shit, I've got to find something. Actually, you sit down and go, how am I going to edit all this stuff I want to put on the blog? And that's, I think people don't, appreciate how into it everyone in that studio is or how much they naturally look at that stuff and I think that if they weren't it would be an absolute nightmare to find nine things a day. One at the back. Okay, we're going to let you have the penultimate question if you pass that back and then I'm going to finish up with one last question. The last question Lawrence asked us was when we had a design company called Hudson Beck, okay, which was bad. And we didn't do very good design at all, but we just about managed to make ends meet. He said, why have you got so many good names of companies? Like, if you could, and it's nice that. And then you called it Hudson Beck. And you said that on a stage in front of about 200 people in Brighton, and we had to go, well, some names, I don't know. It would be an easier question. OK, good, 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 good. <laughs> Sorry, so you don't have any tool to, mo um, I don't know how you to say that, Monotoris monitoring the information, we like don't. to collect like a tool that collects all the stuff from blogs and blogs and blogs, and then you select, you just go through the blogs by yourself? Yeah, it's not, wow. it's not an automated process, no. But also, we don't just find things off other blogs. Yeah. So that would be one small area of research yeah. um, compared to living your life, being interested in that world, mm. which is the big pool of interest, yeah. Uh, oh. we're, we're, we're currently speaking at, at LCC to um, uh, the friends of the school and to um, our fellows about um, mentoring, working as mentors with our postgrad students. And you briefly showed us a, a clip of uh, Sir Paul Smith, who I know spoke at one of your events. And I don't know if you'd describe the relationship that you have with him as as, as mentoring yeah, or yeah, he mentoring yeah exactly. I wonder if you could just say something about that um, and how important or otherwise that's been um, so we know Paul very well from we got really early on it's nice that it was exciting when people said oh do you want to come and cover this event and you can interview someone and from the people who are exhibiting and we got one from the design museum it said you can book an interview slot and it was like, wow, Will, we can do this. We should go and interview someone, all these amazing people. So we got given one minute with Paul Smith. Literally, they gave it to us that one minute. And we were like, amazing, we've got a minute with Paul. And so I went down there and I sat there and it was like an hour after our minute was supposed to be on. And um, he, he somehow found this minute and then he was so bored of all the other journalists. And I think that also he saw, he always says that we're fans of stuff and he's fans of, and he's fans of stuff. He just likes stuff. He fills his shops with stuff. He likes interesting things. And he saw that, and it's nice that. So we, I gave him the magazine. Another reason for doing the magazine, wherever that question was. I gave him the physical magazine, and he went, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read that, and then you should just come in, because I think this is really interesting. I've never seen something like this. And we're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then his PA phoned the day afterwards, and he booked... Bear in mind, this was March. I reckon you went in. Yeah, and then he booked us a meeting for, like, September, October. And we're like, wicked, yeah, definitely. <laughs> like, if, as if we're going to be going in September. We'll just go anyway. And... Um, <laughs> We walked into the office and he had the magazine and he had post-it notes on all the things he really liked and all the things that he didn't like so, well, didn't like so much. But he said, yeah, I read it on the plane. We are like, who is this guy? Like, we expected him just to be one of those massive fashion director guys who never really, um, never really engaged. And so from that moment on, we kind of, we've been to see him. We go and see him three or four times every year and we have our Christmas party there in his amazing... If you've ever seen photos of his office, it's just a, you know, it's like 
Lawrence's office Organized time to chaos. Chaos. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's chaos. And he has so much reference around that there's, he has to meet so many diverse people that he's never not got something to talk about. So he'll run over and he'll be like, oh, have you seen these pens? Like, I know you love pens. And they'll be like, oh, man, this one's black. And, it's and so he just he knows everything about, he, knows, he just knows where everything is in his office. And so he's just amazingly well-referenced. And we look up to that. We could do 10 years of content based just on his office, really. And so along the way, um, I see, we see Paul as a beacon for how you do a scale of a company, but keep the integrity and the values. So, you know, Paul Smith is is genuinely run by Paul Smith and the people there are genuinely small versions of everything he wants that company to be and we we look to him for advice in I guess how we grow but keep those those values true and he's the best at that and yeah so we see him three or four times a year and it's nice to get to take he's the most inspiring man to go and visit and so every year we get to take all of our staff there to have a tour and to see the office and to talk to him about certain things and he's just an absolute kid and so we, I think we get on because we just talk about stuff. We just talk about you know, things we've seen and yeah. So it's a very, I don't know, we never, we never asked to go and see him, but I just think he, I don't know. He's, he like, we just like hanging out now, I guess, which is nice. That was the final comment in those uh, final 20 minutes. Um, look, thank you both very much. That was um, excellent. It was insightful. It was uh, funny. It was interesting. It was all the things we wanted it to be. Uh, there will be now um, 20 minutes of networking uh, over a glass of wine or a bottle of beer. Um, could you please join me in thanking Alex and Will for joining us? Thank you. Thank you.